mind if I said that those those weren't important as well. But it's not my number one priority. Drew Brees, thanks so much for joining me on the Peter King Podcast. You've been enlightening and a lot of fun. Thanks, Peter. It's the MMQB Podcast. Hey, football season's here. It's time to get in the action and play like the pros at mybookie.net. It's the most exciting experience for sports fans. MyBookie features real Vegas odds and incredible player props on every football game. Game already kick off? Well, it's never too late to play. MyBookie has live games with odds updated in real time. And best off, it's optimized for smartphone users for nonstop action on the go. So go online and type MyBookie in your browser and sign up today. Use the promo code KING. That's K-I-N-G, to be entered into their million-dollar prize pool. Or, if you prefer, just make a phone call. Call 844-722-2387. It's a free phone call. 844-722-2387. Join thousands of online players already playing. Only the biggest, only the best, only at my bookie. Sign up today. Some excellent points from Drew Brees, and even more now from Doug Baldwin. Back on the MMQB podcast with Peter King, I'm here with Doug Baldwin, wide receiver with the Seattle Seahawks. And before this season, I thought it was really interesting that the Seattle Seahawks stepped up and paid you and gave you a contract sort of befitting what you have done. And I think a lot of people thought, two, three, four years ago, that maybe you were more of a marginal player, a third or fourth receiver. But the one thing about you that I think is interesting is how you have always sort of used kind of the negativity as fuel. Has that happened your whole life that you've done that or just when you got to this level? No, it's it's occurred my, my entire life. High school, I had similar issues. Little League football, I had similar issues. Um, college, obviously, is well documented. And then um, the struggles that I've had in the, in the NFL are well documented as well. So, yeah, it's always been there. But the reason why I think uh, I've kind of attached myself to it is because it's always been there and it always will be there. There will always be somebody who says something negative about you or something negative about your game. And so you'll always have that ammunition or that fuel you know, readily available at any given moment. Why are you able to use it so effectively, whereas maybe some other players who might feel the same way, it doesn't work the same for them? How exactly do you use it? In two ways. First and foremost, just looking at the criticism, the negativity, to be completely honest, it doesn't bother me that much. You know, I do analyze it, look at my game and say, OK, well, are there things that I can improve? Uh, and that's one of the things that it forces me to do, to self uh, to self analyze, to look myself in the mirror. But then at the same time, it fuels my passion to prove myself right. So if somebody is uh, critiquing my game, that's you know absolutely wrong. Um, then I look at what I know is right, and then I want to go out there and prove myself right again. So that's the way that I internalize it. And, and in that fashion, it doesn't become toxic to me as a vessel. It becomes a productive, positive synergy or energy for me to go out there and do what I need to do. Where did you learn that the mental side of the game can help the physical side of the game? My coach in, uh, at Stanford, Shannon Turley, my strength coach, he won't, he won't take the credit, but he's the guy who, who's put me on the, on the path of the mental side of the game. Uh, he gave me a book when I was, oh, he lent me a book, uh, when I was at Stanford called Mind Gym. Um, and Mind that, Gym? Mind Gym. Uh, Mind G-Y-M? G-Y-M. Yeah. And, and in that book specifically, it talks about the mental side of the game. And one of the quotes in there from Yogi Berra was, 90% of the game is half mental. You know, and, and obviously the math is misunderstood. <laughs> <That's Yogi. in> that. <laughs> but the fact of the matter was is that, you know, the mental side of the game is is vastly more important than the physical, because at this level in the NFL, everybody's an athletic freak, you know, and, and there's not much that differentiates each other from or ourselves from the athletic side or standpoint. But the mental game of it is what can give you and ultimately give you a, an edge over your competition. And so. I've lent on that as much as I possibly could to make sure that I had every possible advantage in my toolbox. What do you do during the course of the week? Are you somebody who 
will Google things about yourself to see what people are saying. I remember, you know, John Randall of the Minnesota Vikings used to take the media guy to the team he was about to play. And he used to read up and, and like, the personal things about, say, Brett Favre or the lineman on the Packers. And he used to come into the game and just bark about it the whole game. (laughs) So, I mean, what do you do to learn about your opposition or to learn about what people out there are saying about you? Well, first and foremost, opposition is easy because we have film. That's easy to study. Yeah, a lot of the, the defensive coordinators are well documented about their types of tendencies, their schemes. So it's very easy to get a feel for the type of defense we're going against. As far as the negativity, I don't have to look it up because it's readily available to me at all times. You know, social media, good and bad, you know, provides that. Yeah, but everybody on social media <laughs> says everybody is a bag of crap. Of, of course. <laughs> but, um, you know, I, I think as, as athletes, uh, thrust into the spotlight, especially on such an important event in our in our society, Sundays, you know, you, you get all of it. So it's very easy for me just to turn on my social media and see all the comments that are being thrown towards my uh, profile. Okay, I got to ask you this one football question about your game against San Francisco. You talk about athletic freaks. You made one of the most ridiculous catches I've ever seen in football. I've covered football for 32 years. You really made one of the great catches, and yet not many people really made a big deal of it. And I watched that this week, and I just said, that is phenomenal. And for those who didn't see it, it was like a crossing route, right? And you dove for a pass that was probably about 18 inches, what appeared to be outside of your grasp. You dove. You brought the ball in with your left hand Mm -hmm. to your body just as you hit the ground. I want you to describe how you're able to make a catch like that and the work that goes into making a catch like that. Well, the first part of it is the mental side of it. You know, we talk about that. And uh, it's basically having um, an absence of thought in those moments. You know, for me, I, I... I can't be thinking about anything else. I can't be thinking about the past or the future, the previous play, the next play. I have to be so... Um, or a safety who might be bearing down on you, getting ready to hit you hard. Or that. You know, it's it's got to be about that specific moment. And in that moment, yeah, the ball was thrown a little bit outside of my frame. But those are the moments where you got to make the best of your opportunities. And we continuously say this all the time. We only get so many opportunities in the passing game. And so when the ball is thrown our way, you got to do everything in your power to get it. So, you know, the mental want to, to go out there and, and make those plays is there for all of us. And so we practice that at times, you know, doing the one handed catches, but, um, it's, it's very rewarding when you get to show that in the game, all the hard work that you did during the week. Tell me when you guys watch that in the film room, in your offensive meeting room or in the receiver's room in the last few days? What was the reaction? A positive one, obviously. You know, a lot of positive comments. But, again, this this is stuff that we do, uh, that we practice. So, um, you know, a lot of congratulations and and nice comments. But the fact of the matter is is that that's our job. So we don't look at it in our room as something uh, as spectacular as others might you know, it's just, okay, you made a good play, and we expect you to make that good play over and over again. How many catches in your life do you think have you made that are better than that one? Any? No, I, th- I think that might <laughs> top the list. <laughs> Talking with Doug Baldwin, wide receiver, the Seattle Seahawks. So, Doug, you have um, you've been sort of thrust into the spotlight a bit in the last few days and really this season by aligning yourself with Colin Kaepernick and with being very empathetic toward his cause. Um, You're on 60 Minutes Sports with John Wertheim talking about that at length. I find something really interesting about that. Your dad is a cop. Mm -hmm. And so what's been the discussion with your father about how this situation, if it can be improved, can be improved in the United States? Well, the the conversation in general has just been about his experience as a police officer, obviously, and what he went through in in training when he was in the academy, uh, things that he learned outside of the academy. um, Where is he a police officer? Well, he 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 was retired, uh, but he was, uh, for 35 years, he was with uh, with the Pensacola Police Department back in Florida. Uh, So, you know, 
very well versed on on how was his experience was it mostly positive or mostly positive he loved what he did uh because he felt like he was you know giving back to the community doing something for his community so uh he was an excellent officer during his time but yeah his his experience was mostly a positive one but our conversations uh tend to, to talk more about his training and what he thought was positive about his training and then also what he thought uh was lacking in his training so during his time as a police officer, he also was with Homeland Security, and so he got to travel the country and, and the world a lot, and he got to see different perspectives and different um, training methods. And the one thing that he told me is that you know the training is not it's not consistent across the country, um, and there's a lot of places that lack the training that he thinks is necessary to eliminate the issues that we've been seeing on our video video feeds. And so, yeah, you know, that's where I started. Is my, my dad, 35 years on the on the force, knows better than I would, and so um, really our conversation is just me, me asking him questions. How does he feel? I'm curious about what some athletes are doing now. However, they're demonstrating either by kneeling, or uh, by a fist, or by interlocking arms. How does he feel about that? Well, he's he's happy that people are speaking up about the situation and he totally agrees that, you know, there's an issue that needs to be resolved. And he agrees with me that he thinks that it should start on the training level, you know, and not necessarily saying that police officers are not trained well. It's just that the training needs to adapt to to the times and to our society now. And so in that sense and, and what he has given me. He's saying that it's not necessarily condemning the police officers. It's really mm-hmm. saying that the training needs to adapt so that um, they can have better tools, better resources in order to protect themselves better and also protect the communities that they serve. Uh, and so that's what his mindset was when I spoke to him. And so he was um, very much in agreement with the message, not necessarily the method. You know, he we didn't really talk about the different methods. It was more so the message that was behind the protests. I wonder where do you think this is going in professional sports? I know that there's been a lot of discussion about what the future of this movement might be. Do you have much of a gut feeling what the near and long-term future is with athletes and trying to do something about the violence? Yeah, I don't think it's going to go away. I think that in football we, t- we took a major step. You know, and I think it's very hard for us as individuals in the NFL to make these types of stances because – you know, it, it affects a large number of people, you know, 53 on active roster, 10 on practice squad. So and then also the entire organization itself, which, you know, employs a lot of people. Um, it's very difficult to make those those strong statements. But um, as as athletes, I don't think it's going to go anywhere, especially with the NBA starting up who, you know, they've always been ahead of the curve in terms of activism and what they've done on the, on the basketball court. So I don't think it's going to change. You know, I think that now more so than anything uh a lot of the athletes are looking towards resolutions and that's not going to go away because we're going to continue to see issues in our society that that need to be changed i want to ask you about something brandon marshall told me about on this podcast two weeks ago Uh, he said what we really need more than anything else i think now is some of the white athletes to sort of back this cause. Chris Long of the New England Patriots has done it. But really, it's been mostly African-American athletes who have done this and not white athletes. What do you think, and do you think that there will come a time that more white players will speak out about it? I think they will. Is is the conversation continues in the locker room and more players of different races become empathetic to the plight of of African Americans in this country, they realize that, you know, there's things that need to be changed. I think it's difficult for other ethnicities to understand it because, you know, it's hard for them to put themselves in the shoes of of other ethnicities and and to feel the experiences that they didn't experience. And so with that, you know, I think it is important that other ethnicities, especially the the white Americans um, in sports, do take part in it and recognize that, you know, it's it's not just a a one-sided thing. In order for us to correct these issues, to find solutions, we have to do it together. Um, and so it's very, it's vitally important that other races get involved. But again, I think as the conversation continues, it's going to be easier for them because they're going to hear the experiences. They're going to um, see the emotions on, on individuals' faces and be able to be empathetic to those situations. Finishing up with Doug Baldwin of the Seattle Seahawks, I got to tell this personal story of this thing between us <laughs> that I think is so 
I just think it's very interesting because sometimes in my business, guys will yell at you or get unhappy with